Hey YouTube, welcome to TCT and the Crazy Troll Nation of YouTube. The crazy because I wait till I sit to do a video and put on chapstick as if I didn't know my lips were already dry. <laughs> the troll because I consider myself a troll when I put on face paint, a cute troll but a troll nonetheless. My name is Dion, which is a pen name that I used for my writing that I carried over um, into the BDSM leather community and also my writing. I'm going to put on face paint today as I talk about the stages of grief. Um, a lot of times people associate grieving with when you lose someone by way of death or even if someone gets really sick, your mind starts thinking, oh my gosh, they're not gonna be here. And so your mind will start to grieve losing this person. Stages of grief also apply to relationships and friendships. Anytime there's a loss in your life, there's a grieving process. If you allow it to happen, um, people who don't readily deal with their feelings or process their feelings, people who prefer <laughs> the easier route to not deal with their feelings, they may never properly grieve and so this thing is always in the back of their mind or they may be triggered later on in life from a similar situation or if someone else gets sick or if someone else dies it'll bring back all of those um those feelings that they haven't dealt with when you have certain feelings and you deal with them you you still may be triggered but the effect is not as harsh as if you had not do, dealt with them or if you had not sought resolution for those feelings and so um, I realized the other day, if you haven't seen my video on, um, breaking up during COVID, go ahead and watch that video. I realized the other day that I was angry. Um, I was first angry with, um, my ex-partner, something he had said. And I began thinking, if you really think about it, the opposite would have been true. <laughs> and so I was just like really angry, just like really analyzing things that he had said. And then I became angry at myself. And I was sitting here and I was just like, what is going on with me? Like, why? <laughs> why am I having these emotions? Like, why am I going from angry to just disbelief? And, um, I am still sleeping a lot, so I know there is still some depression going on with me. And I deal with my therapist calls it situational depression. Like when something happens, I get depressed. I'm not just generally always in a state of mild depression. It's just when something happens, um, I tend to just, I don't shut down because I do analyze things, but I just really just take a step back um, and think things through and I do like how I am able to compartmentalize and I like how when something does happen, I do take time to to step back and think about things. And so I realized I was angry and it's always easier to be angry with someone else. It's always easier to blame someone else because we want to think that we're perfect and that we did everything right. And if you've watched my other video, I talked about how I was a hypocrite. Um, I was wanting transparency from him, but I wasn't being transparent. And that's one of the things that made me angry. And also I realized, sometimes I think that can is too light. And then sometimes like now without foundation on, I'm like, that looks okay, like under my eyes. Um, that was not what I was going to say. <laughs> I thought back to um, other things in our relationship that my gut told me was not right, but I dismissed it. And they call that cognitive distortions when you know that something's not right however this is foundation however you tell yourself oh this is okay because it doesn't really seem to be having an, a negative impact on whatever the situation is and as i look back i realized that those small situations did have an impact on the way things were and i dismissed it because it wasn't anything that was overt or just in your face, like, wow, this is an issue now, you know, however small, but it may turn into a larger issue later. And so that turned into me being angry with myself 
for dismissing um, those little red flags. But before I go further with that, I am going to go over the stages of grief and let you guys know, if you care to keep watching, um, where I am with the stages of grief and how I processed through them. Depending on what website you look at, depending on what article you read, there may be seven, I'm sorry, five stages of grief, or there may be seven. And I was listening to um, a podcast today and they were saying that, I forget the person's name, but there's been another stage added on to the stages of grief. The stages that she listed were five. And so what I looked at, there were seven. The stages do not go in any particular order. They typically start with shock and denial, but after that is however your brain processes things and it depends on also what else is going on in your life that may be taking your attention away from just dealing with this particular issue or whatever the issue is that's causing you the grief. So shock and denial, pain and grief, anger and bargaining, depression and loneliness, the upward turn, Reconstruction and work through, which is what I call personal growth, acceptance and hope. So those are the stages and I will list them below. I did not note the website. You can just Google stages of grief and you know a bunch of articles and things will pop up. But for me, <laughs> the shock was him saying that it, it, our relationship needed to be over because I was completely blindsided. I was just like, and I said, well, can you say why? Like, what? Like, I don't understand. I think I started stuttering because I couldn't even speak. I was just like, I just did not understand. And so he spoke. And then I said again, I know you just explained it, but can you say it again? Because my mind just is not processing what you're saying. Like, it's not, I'm hearing you, but I'm not really hearing you. And so he said what he said again. And I focused because I really did want to <laughs> hear what he had to say. And so I was not in denial, but I was shocked at like, what do you mean we need to not be together? Like, why? And so <laughs> I did experience the shock. <laughs> and our, the, the phone call, as I mentioned in the other video, was an hour long. So that, that helped me. I, I'm hoping it helped him. I, I, I don't know. Um, pain and grief. I didn't. And I'm sorry, pain and guilt. I didn't feel guilty initially, but during the anger stage, I felt a little guilty. And I even thought to like text him and apologize for being a hypocrite and not being transparent, which was not one of the issues that he named, but that's something I realized about myself after the fact was I was not always transparent with him. Um, and my reasoning, which was faulty, was I didn't want him to feel bad about however I was feeling or make his situation worse or whatever like that. And I also realized that I babied his feelings a lot. I mean, he is a grown man. However, the clinician in me, if I think something may be difficult for you, and I know you have, diff and, I, and I know it's challenging for you to deal with certain things sometimes, I'll withhold you know, how I'm feeling because I wanna make sure that you're okay. So I kind of take a back seat for the sake of this person, which I've learned is not the right thing to do, not on a consistent basis if it's not reciprocated, because relationships should be balanced, they should be equal, um, as far as the energy and commitment that are put, put into a relationship. And so, but the guilt went over fairly quickly, because <laughs> um, I kept saying, well, he doesn't want any contact, so it's not gonna do me any good to feel guilty or to keep thinking, you know, I should text him to apologize, because if he doesn't wanna hear from me, then, I just need to get over it. And and that and then that also made me angry because I'm like here I am thinking I should apologize for things and overall the relationship was good. There were some things that were not. Our communication was not as great as I always thought it was. Part of that was me not being transparent and also there was a third party involved that asked him not to share information with me about them, which if you're in a relationship with someone you should feel free to just discuss things. I'm not talking about deep secrets or, you know, things like that, but just in general. And so that's one of the things I had a cognitive distortion about because I thought it wasn't affecting our relationship. But if someone's asking you not to be open with your partner or with a friend, then that person is having a ne negative effect on your relationship because they're asking you to not be open and you're agreeing to it. So that's when I became angry 
that I allowed that and that I thought at the time, well, as long as it doesn't have a negative effect on us, it's fine. I was pissed at myself because it wasn't fine and it was a problem anytime that someone's agreeing to not be open with me and you're in a relationship with me. And so I was mad at myself, even, even as a clinician, even being 50 years old, we were together two years and so I was 48 when we started our relationship. But even knowing the things that I know, I was dismissing, you know, those little things and I was upset with myself. <laughs> I was angry at myself for allowing that situation to continue, which led into me being even more angry with myself for not being transparent and not saying, hey, look, this is an issue for me. This is a problem for me. And, you know, look where it got me. It got me anywhere. It, it didn't get me anywhere. It got us broken up. Well, that's not his reason for us breaking up, but I was angry because I withheld so much. And for what? And I also realized that if I had been open and transparent, I really think our relationship would have ended at least a year ago, maybe longer. Um, yeah, and so that that kind of pissed me off too because if I would have been open and transparent, our relationship, I doubt, would have lasted two years. And then I said, you know what? What good does it do me to be angry because what's done is done? So let's learn from it. <laughs> <laughs> the reconstruction work through personal growth stage. What can I learn from it? What can I learn about myself? And I talked about that a lot in my other video, which I will just go ahead and link below. And so I've already started the, the personal growth part, the reconstruction, working through, you know, how I felt and what he said and, and processing things that way. Um, what kind of caught me off guard a little bit was the depression and loneliness stage. Um, as I said, I am still sleeping more than usual. Well, maybe not. I'm going to sleep at like 6.30 in the morning, and then I might sleep till like 1. So like, what is, how many hours of sleep is that? Like 7 hours of sleep. So yeah, so I'm not really sleeping too much. That's, they say you should get 7 to 8 hours of sleep. So I'm on par with that. It's just that me being nocturnal, <laughs> I'm back to going to sleep when the sun comes up. So I take that back about sleeping longer than usual. So cause I'm really not now that I calculate the, the time frame. Um, but the loneliness, my walking buddy, um, she has a rental property, which may end up being her permanent property in Virginia. And she's the one that I was walking Glasgow Park with, um, a couple times a week. And actually three times a week we were walking while she was up here. That's me tapping powder. And I told her, cause she was planning on going back down to Virginia. And I said to her, I'm like, I'm really going to miss you. I said, cause she, that, she's been like my only personal physical contact and even though she's on one side of the of the lane and I'm on the other side she's been like the only person that I've been like face to face communicating with and also because we do speak objectively we do usually end up talking about things from a clinical standpoint it's been really helpful to me you know processing all of this with her and then I realized I had told her like four times I was going to miss her and I'm just like okay what is what is this like what's going on and when I was thinking about it uh, later that night, actually it was the next night, I realized that I was feeling lonely. Not in that moment, but I was anticipating feeling lonely because she was going back down to um, Virginia and I wouldn't have my walking buddy. I did go walk the park the other day, actually yes, no, two days ago, um, by myself. And it was okay. The weather was nice. Today it's like 85 degrees. I'm like, this is just insane. I want to put my AC on. I have the windows open. I have fans on, but it's just blowing in hot air. And, excuse me. It's just blowing hot air. And so I'm just like really uncomfortable and I'm sweating. Um, but I realized I was anticipating being lonely, anticipating not having that face-to-face -face interaction, that conversation, just company, you know, going for a walk around the park. Um, and so that was, that was an eye opener for me. I'm like, wow. And that's actually what made me look up the stages of grief because I'm like, why am I anticipating feeling lonely like when she leaves? Because I could still come and walk the park. And so it wasn't just walking the park. It was having that face-to-face -face interaction and being able to talk to someone face-to-face -face and not on a phone or over Zoom or whatever other apps you use to see, and see people and talk to them during social distancing. And so when I looked this up, I said, you know what, let me just do a video. And I'm also going to do an article and post on my website about this too. 
Um, so yeah, so I realized that. And she told me, she's like, I'm gonna holler at you. She's from Philadelphia, I'm from New Jersey. She's like, I'm gonna holler at you. And she, she is, she's always been really good about um, keeping up and keeping in touch and things like that. And so, and I did tell her, I, I did finally say, I think I'm just anticipating feeling lonely when you leave because you're like my only, you know, physical contact. You know, she's married and she has a daughter. And so, you know, people say they're isolated. I'm isolated. Those of us who live alone, you know, our spouse or our significant other is not in the other room. You know, our children aren't running around getting on our nerves, as people keep saying, or whatever. Like, I, I'm home by myself. I go walk and check my mail, and I come home. I go walk to the park, and then I come home. If I need to drop something off at the post office that I purchased, and it didn't work out, and I have to be turned it, then I do that, and then I come home. And it's just me and, you know, my writing projects and Netflix and Tubi and <laughs> whatever... <laughs> Oh, what is it? Hulu <laughs> and YouTube. <laughs> and so that's where I am. The last stage is acceptance and hope. Um, the acceptance for me happened during the conversation when he broke up with me. I accepted that. Okay, this is what he's saying. So it's over. I'm not one of those people where I'm going to try to convince you to change your mind. If you say you don't want to be with me, then okay, then the relationship is over. Or even if you say you don't want it over, but you're telling me something different, such as my ex-husband who kept lying about cheating, you're showing me that you are not committed to this relationship. So therefore, there is not a relationship because I'm not going to be in a relationship by myself. And so the hope for me was not so much hope for a better future for the next person. But it was because my hope was knowing that I'm becoming a better person because I've been analyzing myself and my behaviors and my thought processes and, and my patterns of how I do things. And because I have learned about myself and still am learning about myself, that gives me hope because I know that I will be a better person tomorrow than I was today. And so those are the stages. I went through the shock, I went through the guilt, went through the anger, mostly being angry at myself that I've allowed the situation to go on as long as it did. Oh, the upward turn I didn't talk about. The upward upward turn is when you start becoming more relaxed as the anger and depression and pain and guilt, all that starts to leave. Then you start feeling uplifted. And so I don't know. I don't think I actually went through that stage. And I think because I, I went through the stages so quick, the shock was during the call. Um, the guilt the other day, but that was that was very brief. Because then I became angry at myself. And that took me <laughs> like a day to just be like, you know what? Don't be angry at yourself. Just learn from it. And so that pushed me into, well, further into the personal growth stage. So the upward turn, I guess that was me saying, just get over it, learn from it, and move on. So yeah, I guess I did go through the upward turn. The acceptance that happened during the phone call. Because he said he wanted it to be over. It needed to be over. I'm like, okay. And hope... I feel hopeful because I know I am growing as a person. So I, I would like to hear from you what your um, thoughts are on the stages of grief. Have you ever thought of it as it applies to breaking up friendships or losing um, relationships? Did I just say that funny? What I meant to say was... <laughs> What are your thoughts on the stages of grief as it applies to losing friends and or relationships breaking up? Because as I said in the beginning, most people associate it with if someone gets sick or you lose a loved one. But it does pertain to other areas of your life. So what are your thoughts on that? And if you're going through any of this, you know, how are you getting through it? Like, are you journaling? Do you have a, um, a friend you can talk to? Are you in therapy? That sort of thing. What, however it is that you need to get through it. I just suggest that you actually work through it. If you're having thoughts, like when I was angry, it's like, okay, why am I angry at myself? I sat there and asked myself these questions. And so I kind of felt like I was crazy in a way because I do analyze myself and I ask myself questions and then I answer them. A friend of mine, this was maybe like 30 years ago. I'm just doing this because I'm sweating. <laughs> this has no additional product on here. I'm just sweating. Um, she was not a clinician at all. 
um, her background was in finance and I was sharing something with her and this was about 30 years ago and she asked me if you had a client that just told you everything you told me what would your response be and I was like hmm and that stuck with me and so now when I find myself in situations <laughs> and I'm having these thoughts or I'm journaling something, I sit back and think, if someone said this to me, what would my response be? And that's what helps me to think of things objectively instead of like, oh my gosh, this happened to me. It's like, okay, well, how are you feeling about it? So I, so I analyze my feelings. I let the thoughts come. I process them. I think about them. And then I think about what can I learn from it to be a better person. And also to avoid being in that situation. But if you're learning from the experience and you're growing to be a better person, that will reduce the chances of you ending up in that same exact situation again anyway. And so that's something that I do. So I encourage you, if you're the type of person who you usually just let things go, there is an issue, there's a problem, you don't deal with it, you push it aside... Work on not doing that because you will never grow. You will always be in that same place. And you may feel like you're okay, but something's going to trigger that because you never dealt with it. And then it's going to keep coming up. Here's something else I want to say, and I do want to apologize. This video is long. Um, and I've shared this with other people. From And this is something I learned also, you know, through my education and through working. I'm going to use drugs as an example. Because this, this is the easiest example, and people are like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, if, you, if someone starts doing drugs when they're 15, their mental processes stop. Okay, like that old commercial, like if you're my age or older, I'm 50, and they would fry, put an egg in a pan and it fries, and they would say, this is your brain on drugs. Drugs do fry your brain. Like, they, they do alter <laughs> the chemical balances in your brain, and it alters, which alters the way you think. And how you process information and all of that. So if you if someone starts doing drugs when they're 15, their mental processes are stunted. And say they do drugs until they're 25, okay? They start getting help when they're 25. Their brain is still the brain of a 15-year-old, even though their body is 25 years old. And so say they're in therapy for five years until they're 30. Okay, so now their brain is that of a 20-year-old. Because they started at 15 five years of therapy, their brain is now 20, but their body's 35. And so that's why we see a lot of people or we come across a lot of people who are damaged from childhood trauma or drug, drug history or their parents were alcoholics and, or they were abused. Any type of trauma, whether physical, emotional, or mental, it stops your intellectual growth. And so that's why we have a lot of adults who they think and act way younger than they are because they haven't dealt with some of those issues or they have but there was a 10-year gap between when they started drugs or had the trauma and when they stopped doing drugs or started processing the trauma and so they're not their biological age is not their intellectual age and it is not their emotional intellectual age either and so i encourage you the clinician in me <laughs> encourages you and as someone who analyzes myself i encourage you if you're having issues or if you're having problems, deal with it. Do not keep putting it off because you will continue to be in the same place that you're in right now. You may feel better. I'm like, okay, I'm not thinking about this. Life is great. I can pretend. You can pretend all you want to, but sooner or later, if you are to grow as a person, you're going to have to deal with these issues. And it's going to impact all of your friendships. It's going to impact all of your relationships because it's in you. It's not everybody else. It's you. Just like I had to realize, okay, what did I do? I wasn't transparent. I was a hypocrite. I own that. I acknowledge that. That's something I know I need to be from now on is be transparent the same way I desire someone to be transparent with me. And also not ignoring red flags and other little things that I did that I look back and it pissed me off that I did that. I can't change it, but I can grow from it. Think about your situation. Think about what you can learn from it. Work toward being a better person. Do not ignore problems. Do not ignore issues. It's hard. It's hard to look at yourself and be like, what could I have done better? 
because we don't want to think we want to think we're okay and we want to think that we did everything right well we're quick to say i'm not perfect but at the same time we we really believe that we are and that's why we don't want to think about what could i have done differently or what can i change or where did i mess up or what mistakes did i make that's hard to do and it's easier to push that aside and not deal with that even if someone abused us we still need to process that and if we don't we're still going to have that mind of the age we were when we were traumatized. And so I know this was kind of like a rant. It, it's just really important to me because it, it hurts me to see someone in pain and to know that they have within them to overcome things and yet they don't want to because it's challenging. So it's either if you want to stay the same, stay the same. If you want to be better, you're going to have to confront, as they, as they say, confront your demons. And it's hard. It's hard to do. But it's necessary if you want to be a healthy person and if you want to have healthy friendships and relationships. And also, you know, be careful of who your support system is. Because they need to be, whoever it is, needs to be someone that you can be 100% honest with and somebody who's going to be 100% honest with you. If you're realizing you're withholding information because you want them to be on your side or because you're embarrassed or, you know, you feel stupid or whatever it is, then talk to a therapist because they're supposed to be third person objective people. That didn't even make sense. <laughs> a therapist is supposed to be objective. Supposed to be a third person objectively analyzing your situation to help you overcome that situation. And so if you don't want to open up to close family members, but then I, I question how close are they when you don't share your innermost heartfelt feelings with them. So I kind of question that too just in general, but have a support system, people that you love, people that you trust that you can go to. And if not, find a therapist. And especially now during COVID, there's all kind of hotline numbers and emergency numbers you can call if you need somebody to talk to. Um, if you can though, find someone on a regular basis that you can talk to, especially if you're going to be getting into therapy, it does help to not have to say the same beginning story all over and over again. Once they get to know you, you can just jump into the session and not have to rehash you know, all of the gritty stuff. And so that's it for this video because I feel like I can go on and on and on because my clinician clicked and you guys probably have seen it. But um, yeah, so I'm just excited at what I'm learning about myself and I'm gonna turn a fan on. <laughs> it is hot. It is so hot in here. I am like sweaty. So thank you for watching. Leave comments below. Um, if you don't want to comment below, but it's something you want to say to me, you can find me on Twitter um, or just email me. That'll probably be the easiest thing. Um, I do not use Facebook Messenger um, for reasons I won't get into. But <laughs> thank you for watching.